Was there a major war amongst the gods? And a war that could have defined pantheons and cemented differences between cultures? A war that must have been so great that stories were told about it ever since, in different ways, by different cultures? What am I talking about, you may ask? Well, have you ever considered why the Aesir fought the Vanir in the Nordic mythology, or why Cain fought Abel? Why there are Asurs and Devas in Vedic culture, and Titans and Olympians in Greek? Just to name a few. So why do so many cultures within the Indo-European and the Near East regions have a story of conflict, and one that on the surface seems very similar? And do they all stem from an original conflict that left a huge mark on these cultures? This is what I'm going to look at today. And so if this sounds interesting to you, then grab yourself a cup of tea and welcome to Craig and Ford. Before we dive into the depths of myths and motifs, let me start by summarising the Nordic story of the Asir Vanir War, which will allow us to put some context around this subject. Now, the story does vary depending on the source you use, as it is mentioned in a number of poems and prose, but this is my interpretation. The war began when the gods of the Asir refused to honour Golvi, a goddess of the Vanir who represented wealth and greed. The Asir attempted to kill Golvig three times, but she kept resurrecting. And it was this incident that escalated into the conflict between the two groups of gods. The war was long and fierce, with neither side being able to gain an advantage over the other. And it was eventually realised by both the Asir and the Vanir that they were evenly matched, and that the conflict would therefore lead to a mutual destruction if it continued. To resolve the war and establish peace, both groups decided to exchange hostages. The Vanir sent their gods, Nord, Frey and Rea, to live amongst the Asir, and the Asir sent Mimir and Hunir to the Vanir. This exchange of hostages can be seen as a merging of the two groups of gods and allowed the establishment of a truce. The peace was enforced with a spittle ritual, which I talk about in the video on the Meda poetry, and this ritual led to the creation of the god Kvasir, who was considered the most knowledgeable god who existed, and he shared this knowledge with both the Asir and the Vanir. Now, when looking at the old Norse myths, we see that the Vanir are considered Fertility gods, gods that would probably have originated from an agricultural background, and the Esir could be considered the more Indo-European rooted gods, and so these probably derived from the culture of the pastoral farmers. Now this conflict has been analysed by many scholars, and I'll give you my own take on it a bit later in the video. But it is important to note, as we'll show in a moment, that a conflict between different gods in the same pantheon wasn't unique to the Nordic people. We see time and again stories of conflict across Indo-European cultures and in Near Eastern cultures as well. Conflict between gods and occasionally conflict between heroes. And because we know that these two cultures, the Indo-Europeans and the early European farmers, came into contact with each other, and this happened in many places, but one specific place where it happened was the Caspian Pontiac Steppe, the home of the Proto-Indo-European language and the earliest Indo-Europeans, which was around 6,000 years ago. And this is because part of the origins of the Indo-Europeans was influenced by the early agricultural migrants originally from the Near East. And so if we put all this together, could we then say that this motif in mythology is a remnant of a conflict from the start of the Indo-European culture with the early European farmers? And if so, then was this conflict significant enough that it, this story spread as the Indo-Europeans dispersed across Europe, in effect, a memory of agricultural and pastoral gods clashing? And this is the question I will ask, and 
answer today to show why there are stories of conflict between gods or heroes which are common amongst many of the Indo-European and Near Eastern cultures' mythologies. And to understand this, we need to tackle the various mythologies where this conflict occurs, such as with the Titans and the Olympians, or different characters such as Cain and Abel. And these stories representing the clashing of cultures, or are they representing something else, such as a conflict between classes of men or social structure? And so let's look at some of these examples. As I mentioned within the story at the start of this video, within Nordic mythology, we see the agricultural and fertility gods of the Vanir fight the Asir at the beginning of time. And some have argued that this could be a representation of local fertility cults fighting Germanic war cults. But the descriptions of this conflict within poems in the Poetic Edda and in the Prose Edda focus more on the truce about how different cultures resolved conflicts so they could live together, as opposed to the battles and the war itself. And some scholars even say that the idea that there was even a war isn't even certain. It does seem that the resolution of this conflict, which was through hostage exchange and eventual truce, may symbolise the need for cooperation and coexistence between competing cultures. But this conflict could also be giving acknowledgement to the distinction of culture between the agricultural and pastoral workers. And so, because of this, there are some who say that this war is about the invasion of the Indo-Europeans into early European farming lands, which would make this an incredible reference to what would have been a major conflict due to it being remembered in mythology. And it would help explain why this motif is then told elsewhere in the Indo-European landscape. But we should also note what Dumazil said about this conflict, which is that this event may be purely fictitious, and so not referring to an actual event in our ancestors' history. And so we see other scholars paralleling it to the Roman myth of the rape of the Sabine women or the battles between the Devas and the Asuras from Hindu mythology. And so let's look at these to see where this motif comes from. In Vedic mythology, there are two families of gods in a similar vein to the Nordic pantheon. And these groups of gods are called the Devas and the Asuras. Now, some have tried linking the Asuras with the Asir Nordic culture as they both are descended from the Proto-Indo-European speaking peoples. And their names share phonetic similarities with both being able to be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European root hensus, which means lord or ruler. Probably the most well-known story of the conflict between the Asuras and the Devas is the story of the churn of the ocean or the Samudra Manthan. This story starts when the Devas lose their strength and power due to a curse, and so must acquire Amrita, the nectar of immortality, to regain this power. And this was hidden in the depths of the cosmic ocean. Realising they could not churn the ocean by themselves to recover the nectar, the Devas made a temporary truce with their rivals, the Asuras, to work together to churn the ocean and retrieve the Amrita. Now, Using the great serpent Vasuki as a churning rope and Mount Mandara as a churning rod, the Devas and the Asuras began churning. And as they churned the ocean, various treasures and divine beings emerged, including the goddess Lakshmi, the celestial elephant Aravata, and the divine cow Kamadenu, before eventually recovering the pot of Amlita. However, the Asuras tried to seize the nectar for themselves, which led to a fierce battle between the Devas and the Asuras over the possession of Amrita. And to ensure the Asuras could not obtain Amrita, the god Vishnu took the form of Mohini, a beautiful enchantress, and tricked the Asuras by offering to distribute the Amrita between them and the Devas. Mohini then proceeded to distribute the Amrita only to the Devas, thereby restoring their powers and ensuring their victory over the Asuras. And you have to admit, there are some nuances within the story that link it to the Mead of Poetry story from the Nordic culture. But for 
us, we must also consider that only towards the end of the Vedic culture, around two and a half thousand years ago, the Asuras were considered demonic or even anti-gods. And these gods at this time, unlike their Scandinavian cousins, were engaged in a, well, a perpetual mythological conflict, what scholars believe to be a representation of the struggle between order and chaos throughout the cosmos. But as I said, this conflict seemed to get more intense as time went on, and these gods evolved with the culture and society. The earlier depictions of Asuras had them appear as powerful beings, but with both positive and negative traits, and they were associated with cosmic order, and were sometimes considered to be morally ambiguous. So we certainly see that in the early Vedic period, the devas were often depicted as celestial beings or gods uh, associated with cosmic order, but as time went on, they became more predominantly portrayed as adversaries of the devas, embodying chaos, darkness, and destructive forces. And so, to me, the conflict doesn't seem an obvious analogy to the Nordic war, despite some similarity in the motifs. But let's look at Roman mythology to see if that can help us. The Roman pantheon shows a division between the indigenous gods, the Dean Degates, and the gods introduced at a later date, the Dean Novan Silis. The Dean Degates represent the gods associated with agriculture, nature, and perhaps some local cults, while the Dean Novan Silis include deities assimilated from other cultures external to Rome, particularly the Greek pantheon, and tend to be associated with the arts, knowledge, and war. This division can be seen as a reflection of the difference between the indigenous agricultural practices and the influence of the pastoral Greeks after the Indo-Europeans had firmly established control of the region. But we don't find conflict here, not in the ongoing lives of the gods. Instead, we must look to a version of their creation myth, the myth of Romulus and Remus, And within it, there is a motif known as the Rape of the Sabine Women, which uses an early meaning of the word rape, which is abduction. This story tells of how Romulus invited other cultures to celebrate in Rome. And whilst they were there, Romulus' men abducted women from the other tribes, including the Sabines, so he would have enough women for them to start families with his newly found Rome, which, as an aside, aligns very much with how Indo-Europeans behaved when founding new communities in their earlier years. Now, eventually Rome and the Sabines found peace after this abduction, and that's through the interjection of the Sabine women. And so this conflict is not one of pure culture, but one of societal need. But there are other myths too from other cultures we should look at, And perhaps we should start with what is the most well-known culture, the Greeks. In Greek mythology, we have the Olympian gods and the Titans, the latter of whom were primordial beings and created the gods. And between them, we see this conflict of order against the raw nature of primordial chaos. These gods weren't at war per se, but there was a conflict that saw the all the Titans eventually being imprisoned in the underworld by their children, the younger Olympians. So setting a real distinction, which was between these two sets of deities, the new replacing the old, which could be argued to be in some ways analogous to the pastoral farmers replacing the agricultural farmers. Except the myth of the castration and the imprisonment of the Titans is an agricultural myth, and one I tell uh, the origin of uh, through many different versions of the story in this video. And so, probably not one influenced by the Indo-Europeans and would not be reflective of the influences we are looking for. In Irish mythology, we see the Tutha de Danan associated with culture and fertility as being in conflict with the Favorians, a race of supernatural beings typically linked to chaos, destruction and untamed aspects of nature, primordial beings again. Now, One example of a conflict between the two groups is the Second Battle of Magdurid, which is sometimes known as the Battle of Moitura. This battle takes place after the Tutha de Danan 
arrived in Ireland and defeated the Fir Bolg, who were the previous inhabitants of the land. After this victory, the Tutha de Danan faced the Favorians, who demanded tribute from the Tutha de Danan, and the two groups were further combined when the Tutha de Danan's king, Bress, married a Favorian princess, Ayu. But unfortunately for the Tutha de Danan, Bress turned out to be a cruel ruler favouring the Favorians over his people, and so the Tutha de Danan rebelled against him with help from their chief god, Luch, who was a skilled warrior. And thus, the Second Battle of Mag Tuled started, which was a fierce and bloody conflict, and during which many heroes and warriors on both sides were slain. Luch ultimately faced off against the Favorian leader, Balor of the Evil Eye, whose gaze could kill anyone it fell upon, but Luch managed to kill Balor by using a sling to drive his deadly eye through his head and which caused it to fall on the Favorian army and wreak havoc amongst their ranks. And so, with Balor defeated, the Tutha de Danani emerged victorious, and Brest was captured, and the Favorians were forced to retreat, and the Tutha de Danani then established themselves as the ruling divine race in Ireland, ushering in a golden era of prosperity and the culture. Now... This seems very similar in some ways to the Nordic myth, and whilst there is no specific link to the cultures being Indo-European and early European farming in terms of this myth, it is definitely a myth about the new replacing the old. As I mentioned at the start, these conflicts weren't limited to the Indo-European region. We see a couple of Sumerian myths that have similar patterns, although not as aggressive or warlike. First, we have Enlil and Enki, two of what could be argued as being the most important gods of Sumerian mythology. Enlil is also known as Lord of the Wind and the God of Air and Wind and Storms, was considered the supreme deity in some Sumerian myths, he representing sort of authority, order and kingship. Enki, also known as Lord of the Earth or Lord of the Waters, is the God of Water, Wisdom and Creation. He is associated with fertility, magic, and the life-giving aspects of the natural world. Now, one of the key myths that highlighted the conflict is the story of the flood, where Enlil creates the world and the gods, but he grows weary of their constant noise, and to fix the problem, he decides to unleash a flood to destroy them. Enki, who was responsible for the creation of humans, learns of Enlil's plans and intervenes and allows one human and his family to survive. When Enlil discovers that Enki has thwarted his plan, he becomes angry, but ultimately accepts Enki's actions and agrees to find a different solution. We also have another Sumerian myth, which is Dumazid and his sister Geshitana, experiencing a conflict over their roles in the Divine Pantheon. Dumazid, who is also known as Tammuz, was a god of shepherding and fertility, while his sister Geshitana was the goddess of agriculture. The most famous part of their story involves the descent of Inanna, who is also known as Ishtar, the goddess of love and war, and she descends into the underworld, and I'll talk more about this in this video. But Inanna is married to Dumzid, and after her return from the underworld, she must find a substitute to take her place in the underworld, and decides to send her husband, Dumzid, because, well, he didn't properly mourn for her. Dumazid tries to escape his fate, but is captured by the demons sent by Iniana, at which point his sister, Geshtinana, offers to share his fate, showing her deep love and loyalty to her brother. And as a result, the two siblings reach a compromise with the gods, agreeing to take turns, spending half the year in the underworld, allowing the other to remain on Earth. And this myth of Dumazid and Geshtinana and their sort of alternating presence in the underworld is symbolic of the changing seasons with Dumazid's time in the underworld corresponding to the barren months of winter and spring, whilst uh, Gestinana's absence results in the fertile period of summer and autumn when the harvest is made. This story shows 
the environmental outcome of two competing deities, the brother and the sister, and so not a war. And this probably isn't aligned with any of those Indo-European myths that I've mentioned. But one story I'm regularly asked about is the biblical account of Cain and Abel, found in Genesis of the Bible, with many wanting to compare it to the motif of the divine twins in Indo-European mythology. But this story is not about divine twins. They are not twins after all. But instead, it presents a narrative that can be seen not only as sibling rivalry, but could also be argued as cultural, with the brothers representing agricultural and pastoral farming. In this story, Cain is the elder brother, an agricultural farmer, whilst Abel, the younger brother, is a pastoral farmer. When they each make an offering to the god, Abel's is favoured, which leads to Cain being jealous of his brother and eventually murdering him. Now, to some, this could be considered analogous to Indo-European farmers fighting the early European farmers. But then why have individuals in this conflict as opposed to the gods? You know, the gods we see in Indo-European mythology. Well, that is because Cain and Abel were from a monotheistic religion, and so you couldn't have a war between gods with only one god. And the stories within the Bible were often rewritten considering this, although not always, as we still see hints of polytheism left within its text in certain places. But this is why people were placed in the story and not gods. But even then, this story is probably best explained as being about local cultural differences rather than between larger cultures. The purpose of looking at these motifs and their distribution is to see if there is a theme within these myths that is repeated and which could come from an original and single source, a source that could represent an initial conflict. As when first reading these myths, some may perceive, and this would certainly be true if you're aware of Near Eastern and Indo-European migrations, that there seems to be a common theme of conflict between agricultural and pastoral interests. But the fact is, this consistent theme of conflict between cultures is not consistent. And distinguishing cultures by their farming prevalence is, well, even less so. Many of the conflicts are regarding social themes or classes between new people and old people. And so whilst we see conflicts in myths such as Cain and Abel of the Vanilla and Asia as a conflict that can be tied to culture, and specifically farming culture, and I could see how one could possibly jump to a conclusion then for an analogue between a conflict of early European farmers and the Indian Europeans. We also have to be cognizant of the fact that there are examples of conflict such as the Greek Olympians and Titans or the Roman de Indignities and the de Novelisilis, which are not so linked to culture and so may require more nuanced analysis to identify any alignment with the myths of, let's say, Cain and Abel or the Veneer and the Esir. What we can say about these myths, though, is that on a more general basis, they can help us understand how ancient societies used myth and religion to express the tensions between competing ways of life, with some of these differences being cultural, but some being aligned to social issues and some specific to class. And this is an important point to consider. These motifs have been suggested by some academics as being a result of class struggles within Indo-European culture. But then this wouldn't explain why we see the motif in Near Eastern myth, unless these myths were influenced by the Indo-Europeans, which they weren't, we clearly see the Near Eastern myth travel into Europe and then the Indo-European myths overlaid on top of them and not the other way around. And I'm also aware of the distribution of the motif of conflict. I mean, looking at the map, we see that it has reached the extremities of the Indo-European landscape. But again, we need to look at the myth themes and the diffusion elsewhere. And all these point to the myth not travelling 
but being recreated, reshaped in different regions depending on the social and environmental considerations at the time. To me, as much as I would like this myth to be about the conflict between the Indo-European gods and the agricultural gods, because that would have made for a a good headline and an even greater story, it seems so the commonality of the motif is down to the fact that we all like a good conflict story in our culture or religion, something to explain why our gods are the best or that you know, we are on the right side or we're socialising with the right people. And those stories that make this myth are influenced, like all myths, by the environment, the social structure and religion. There was no great war between the early European farmers and the Indian Europeans. There were local fights, tensions between communities and disagreements between cultures, but no great war that we can evidence, just a human desire to talk about conflict as a means to make a resolution. And this resolution seems to be the important motif in many of these myths. And perhaps we can learn something from that. And so I hope with that, you have learned something new, new myths and motifs. And if you want to learn more, then perhaps an understanding of the role of the king in in the European myths will help you understand the Indo-European's view of the world a lot more. So thank you for hitting the subscribe button and for your support. And thanks to all my patrons for their support as well. So with that, please stay safe and well. And this was Crack and Fall.